Today we are going to look in the, uh, in the two presentations. Uh, first, we are going to look at the Day of Atonement uh, in Israel. Thank you, brother. And then we are going to look at it in um, how the Bible talks about the Day of Atonement, and then we're going to look at how the symbols met and continue to meet the reality. And then in the second session, we are going to look at um, how we must prepare ourselves uh, for the times in which we are living and the judgment. And so I think it's going to be a, a wonderful time together. I've got to finish by, th by three, don't I? Uh, right. The first one is uh, three o'clock. Yeah, okay. And then 3.30 till uh, 8.30, 9.30. <laughs> yeah. All right, let us. Why don't we bow our head and then we uh, ask the Lord to teach us. A gracious Father, this afternoon we come to you as little children, erring, ignorant, and prone, Father, to think that we know it all. Therefore, Father, we pray that you will teach us through your Spirit, that he will be the great teacher, and under his teaching ability, Christ will grow precious to us. Father, we've all come with uh, um, different backgrounds, cultures, um, genders, and all the things that make us different. And Father, I as a human being cannot reach the heart of everyone. And so I pray in the name of Christ that you will take the message this afternoon and that you will apply it to the needs that we have personally. So that then at the end of our time together, we will know that God has spoken to us individually. We thank you for doing that. So now, Lord, I lay myself at your feet in realization that you have chosen me not because I am any better than anyone here, but because of your amazing grace. And therefore, Lord, I pray that my part that I must play will not hinder your glory, but the opposite, that I will be a tool in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I'd like to invite you to come with me to the book of uh, Leviticus, chapter 16. And we are going to read the description that uh, Moses recorded of the Day of Atonement. It says this, And Jehovah spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before Jehovah and they died. And Jehovah said to Moses, Speak to Aaron your brother that he does not come at all times into the sanctuary within the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, so that he will not die, for I will appear in the cloud on the mercy seat. And Aaron shall come into the sanctuary this way, with a bull, a son of the herd, for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen uh, breeches on his flesh, and he shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre he shall be dressed. These are the holy garments. And he shall wash his flesh in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a, for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his young bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two he goats and present them before Jehovah at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots on the two he goats, one lot for Jehovah and the other lot for, the, for a complete removal. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which Jehovah's lot fell and offer it for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the complete removal or the um, scapegoat shall be presented alive before Jehovah to make an atonement with him to let him go for a complete removal into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the young bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, 
and shall atone for himself and for his house, and shall kill the young bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from off the altar before Jehovah, and his hands full of fragrant perfumes, be beaten small and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before Jehovah. And the cloud of the incense shall cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony. And he shall not die. And he shall take off the blood of the young bull and shall sprinkle with his finger. And on the front of the mercy seat eastward. And he shall sprinkle at the front of the mercy seat seven times from the blood of uh, with his finger. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and he shall do with that blood as he did with the blood of the young bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat and he shall atone for the sanctuary because of the uncleanness of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of the congregation which remains with them in the midst of their uncleanness. And this shall be, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make an atonement in the sanctuary until he comes out and has made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before Jehovah and make an atonement for it. And he shall take some of the blood of the young bull and of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the sons of Israel. And when he has made an end of reconciling the sanctuary and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over him all the sins of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them on the head on the goat, and shall send away by the hand of a chosen man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear on him all their sins to a land in which no one lives. And he shall let the goat go into the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall strip off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the sanctuary and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall, be, uh, shall he burn on the altar and he that let go the goat for the complete removal shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward come into the camp." And the young bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall they carry forth outside the camp and they shall burn their skins in the fire and their flesh and their dung. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward he shall come into the camp. It's a, it's a complicated day. It has a lot of details and uh, there's a lot that this chapter actually tells us regarding the Day of Atonement. And I'd like to put the, or the, the order of the events to make it a little bit clearer in your, uh, in your mind. The day began with the high priest actually washing his body. Once he washed his body, then he would dress himself with the holy garments but this day, the, the high priest this did not actually dress as high priest. He just dressed himself as a common priest. Though he was the high priest, because only the high priest could uh, officiate in the ceremony of the Day of Atonement. Then he would take from the children of Israel uh, the necessary uh, animals to accomplish the, uh, the, the events of the day, the ceremonies of the day. He would then cast lots on two of those animals. They would give him two goats and he would cast lots on the, on the goats. And it is not clear the way they cast lots. Some say that in a box there was the name 
you know, goat for Jehovah, and the other one was goat for Azazel, uh, or a scapegoat, and then, you know, he would take and say, well, this is the goat for Azazel, and this is the goat for Jehovah. But, um, you know, this, it's not clear. It could have been, you know, t- sticks, or it could have been, you know, a system of dice. It's not clear what uh, they did. But he cast the, the, uh, the lots upon these two animals, and one goat was chosen for the Lord, and the other one as the scapegoat or a sassel. And then, uh, he, once he did that, he then would uh, sanctify himself and his people, or, or he would sacrifice for him and his family. And he did that by taking a bull, a young bull, kill it, and he would carry that blood right into the most holy place and he would offer incense on the altar of incense so that the cloud would cover, of incense would cover the Shekinah glory and then he would uh, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and then he would come out again. So he would go into the holy place, then he would come out, he would sacrifice the living goat, he would sacrifice it for the people and he would take the blood back into the holy place and, uh, and he would go right into the most holy place and he would now cleanse the sanctuary. He would do a, a ritual of sprinkling blood as he did with the blood of the bull. Then once he had accomplished it in the most holy place, he would come out to the holy place and he would sprinkle blood everywhere in the holy place. And then he would come out to the courtyard and put blood on the four horns of the altar of sacrifice. Once he had accomplished that, then the high priest, they would bring the living goat, the, the, the scapegoat, or go, goat for Azazel, and he would put his hands on the head of that goat. He would confess the sins of all of Israel, all their transgressions, all their rebellions, and he would put them on the goat, and then a, a man who had been chosen would take that goat to a wilderness and would allow the, the, the goat you know, to, to perish there in the wilderness or live as a wild goat. Then the, the, the high priest would go back into, now not the most holy place, he would go back into the sanctuary, into the holy place, and there he would change his garments. And he would put his own garments, and then he would come out again and sacrifice a burnt offering, again for atonement. And once he had sacrificed the the burnt offering, there would be a ritual of cleansing and purification, of taking away all the carcasses of the animals that had been sacrificed. They would be burnt outside. The man that had been chosen for these ceremonies, they would wash their bodies and they would come in. And once this had been accomplished, then Israel had accomplished the day of atonement. Atonement, and Israel was, was one with God. They had been completely reconciled. There was no record of sin. And there was nothing that separated them from God. And then five days later, they would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which was the great celebration that God and his children were one. It was a celebration of victory. And so this is the Day of Atonement. And it, uh, the, the, the purpose of the day was to cleanse Israel and to bring the ultimate reconciliation between Israel and God. And uh, when you look at the whole ceremony, it was divided actually in two parts. When you study the whole ceremony, there were two divisions. One was the preparation for the cleansing, and then came the actual event, which was the cleansing of the sanctuary and the final uh, purification. And so the, 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 the high priest would do a series of rituals that would prepare and ensure that he was right and everything was right and set to move to the actual event of cleansing. So you, you, you may ask yourself, what does that have to do with me? Well, in the scriptures, everything is there for a purpose. God does not waste ink, does he? Neither he wastes paper. And so the Lord has chosen to leave these rituals, these symbols, so that we can learn about the great plan of redemption. The purpose of the Day of Atonement had a number of uh, objectives. In Leviticus 16.30 it says, For on that day an atonement shall be made for you, 
to cleanse you so that you may be clean from all your sins before Jehovah. So what, what were the purpose? What was the purpose of the Day of Atonement? Double. It was to cleanse and to atone. Not as now here, Leviticus 16, 33 to 34. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statue to you to make an atonement for the sons of Israel for their sins once a year. And he did as Jehovah commanded uh, Moses. So the purpose was to provide a, a cleansing and to provide atonement for the covering. The people, the priesthood, and the sanctuary were atoned for and cleansed. And then in Leviticus 23, we are given one more objective of the Day of Atonement, which is, which is part of the whole uh, spirit of the day. It says, and you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement in order to make an atonement for you before Jehovah you are your God. Notice now, for any soul who is not humbled in that same day shall be cut off from among his people. And any soul who does, doesn't, does any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. So the day clearly carried a sentiment of judgment, didn't it? The day was a day of judgment. So the whole thing of atonement and cleansing was brought through a process of judgment. The people came around the temple. The high priest was doing his work in there. And they knew that in order for their place in Israel to be secure, they had to have confessed. They had had to prepare themselves. And they had to be in the spirit of the day. And we're going to study that in, in our next presentation. Today I want to just look at, the, or this, uh, in this first presentation, I want to look at the symbolisms of the Day of Atonement. What, what does it say to us? Is this a ceremony that only had value in the days of Israel? Or is it there that something that you and I can actually learn from the symbols that were encoded in this uh, experience of the Day of Atonement? The Bible says that that which the Lord gave us in the Old Testament, or the Lord gave to Israel in the Old, the Old Testament, was symbolic. Notice what uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 9 says. For it was symbolic, referring to the whole sanctuary system, the, their services, their sacrifices, their, 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 their uh, rituals and feasts. It was all what? Symbolic for when? For the present time in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him who did the service perfect as regarding conscience. Why not? Why couldn't those sacrifices and rituals and services make perfect the person who came to the sanctuary? Because it was symbolic. The rituals were not the great reality. The, the, the rituals, the sacrifices, the temple itself was all symbolic, pointing to a greater reality. And Paul says that that greater reality was our present time. And so the Old Testament sanctuary and its services were symbolic of the great reality that came into existence when Jesus began his work. And so as we look then at the Day of Atonement, as it is recorded there in the book of Leviticus, that record of the Day of Atonement recorded in symbols is actually a magnificent representation that teaches us in detail regarding the great work of the Day of Atonement that would take place with Jesus Christ. You see, friends, you and I cannot look at what Jesus is doing today in heaven, do we? And so how does God manage to give us truth, to give us information so that our mind can be fed with truth and we can have an intelligent faith, a faith that goes with Christ where He is? How has He done that? He has done it by giving us 
All that we have today in reality, he has given it to us in symbols in the Old Testament. So that you and I, can, by studying the symbols, can actually learn in almost perfect detail what Christ is doing today for us in heaven. Do you believe that? Amen? Amen. So then this, you, you will discover as you study the scriptures that God is a God of sanctuary. He lives in a temple. He, has, he created the planet earth in a sanctuary model. And the whole universe, as a matter of fact, it is created in a sanctuary, mo sanctuary model. So God is a God of sanctuary. Amen? Amen? And when you and I begin to study this awesome subject of the sanctuary, we are actually studying a subject that is so deep that we will never cease to study it and search it throughout eternity. It's just it's beautiful. It's one of my favorite subjects. In Hebrews 9, 11, and 12... Um, Paul gives us an example of the symbology. He says, But when Christ had become a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is not of this building, nor by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered once for all into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So what is the symbology? The, the, the Old Testament who was a symbol of the greater and more perfect tabernacle which was not made with human hands. Amen? You know, I, I hear sometimes people and professors say, oh no, there is no sanctuary in heaven. How can they say not when the Apostle Paul repeats it over and over in the book of Hebrews? Amen? Amen? And then the Apostle tells us that the sacrifices... And the blood were a symbol of a greater reality. Who did they symbolize? They symbolized the death and sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? So by looking at the symbology of the Old Testament, you and I can actually understand the reality in which we are living. Isn't that beautiful? Only God can do stuff like that. And the amazing thing is that when God encodes something in symbols, the, the, the depths of meaning that you can pack in a symbol, it's just amazing. Only God can do that. Amen? And so then it is a challenge to human reason and human intelligence coupled with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to begin to search the Scriptures and to unpack and unravel the symbols, discovering the meaning that God has left in these amazing symbols. And dear friends, I grew up an Adventist and I grew up hearing these things. And the more I study the sanctuary, it's like peeling liars. You go, shh, shh, and it never ceases. It's like peeling an onion, yes or no? It's just amazing. And so today, I would like to show you how the Day of Atonement in Leviticus, sim in symbols, actually predicted in amazing detail what was going to happen in the Day of Atonement, in reality. Amen? So let us look from symbol to reality. So these are the things that we need to look at. I'm going to just move very quickly. This, the, these, are the, these were the symbols. The whole day was encoded in symbols. The priest washes his body. Then he dresses himself. Then he takes sacrifices from the people. Then he divides the two goats between the, go the goat for the Lord, the goat for Azazel. Then he makes a sacrifice for himself and goes for first time into the most holy place offering blood for him. But there is, there is no cleansing. He just offers blood for him. Then he comes out and he makes a sacrifice for the children of Israel. And then he goes right in, back into the most holy place. And now he performs the work of cleansing. And, and, and he comes out from the most holy place all the way through to the courtyard and finishes this work of cleansing with the altar of sacrifice. Once he has done the altar of sacrifice, he conducts now the ritual of the scapegoat by confessing of the, the sins of all the children of Israel onto the scapegoat and they take the scapegoat onto the wilderness and then he goes back into the holy place and he changes his clothes 
Once he has changed his clothes, he comes out onto the courtyard again. And once he has done that, he now offers a burnt offering. And when he offers the burnt offering, then the whole thing finishes by purifying and cleansing the whole thing through fire and water. And then the day is over. So let us look step by step. There is a section of preparation and then the event itself. The high priest washes himself. Question, who does the high priest represent? Everything in the sanctuary, especially the high priest and the sacrifice are a symbol of Christ. Amen? So this tells us that in order for Jesus to do his work of day of atonement, the work of judgment, before he can do that work of judgment, he must first go through an experience of washing himself. True? He has to because the, 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 the type is very close to the anti-type. And we learn of the, of the reality through the symbols. True? Are you following me? And so as we look at the symbols, we ask the question, how did Jesus fulfill this? What did Jesus do that brought this to fruition? Because everything has to be fulfilled. Amen? And so when we look at the sanctuary system... To understand what happened, we go from, just very quickly, came Jesus. As we study the scriptures, Jesus was God, true? In the very, in the very image of God, true? He was equal with the Father, yes or no? Yes. Are you, don't, don't fall asleep. Are you, yeah, did you hear what I just said? So the place above all in the sanctuary that represented the presence of God was the most holy place. Amen? And so Jesus came from the most holy place and he humbled himself, the Bible says. And so he came from the most holy place as being equal with God and he became the word of God, the son of God. And he lived amongst the angels as one of them to represent God to them. And then when man fell in sin after 4,000 years of sin, Jesus was born on planet earth because the courtyard is a symbol of planet earth. So the courtyard is a symbol of planet earth. The temple itself is a symbol of heaven. Amen? Very interesting. You follow the scriptures and you will find that the Bible tells us about the birth of Jesus. And then we know nothing about his childhood. True? What is the next event that the Bible tells us about? It's the beginning of his ministry that begins when? When he is, when he is what? Isn't that amazing that the temple puts in the trajectory of Jesus, the first event that is going to appear is his actual baptism. And now what is baptism? Isn't the washing of the body? So according to the reality, when Jesus is baptized, he's actually, he has begun the preparation for the day of atonement. True? He has washed his body. Amen? Amen? Now, there was another ceremony that was also very special, which was the dedication of the high priest. When he was anointed that high priest, and you will find that it followed exactly the same steps. The first thing he did, he had to wash his body. And so Jesus, friends, he is washed. That's why he says to John the Baptist that we may fulfill all righteousness. This was predicted. In order for Christ to do his work as a high priest in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, he had to wash himself in the courtyard on planet earth. And when did he fulfill that? When he was baptized. What happens after the baptism of Jesus? Well, according to the... the, 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 the the, the um, symbols, the next thing is that the high priest has to dress himself. But he doesn't dress himself as a high priest. He clothes himself in the simple garments of a normal priest. Now in the Bible, clothes, linen, is a symbol of righteousness, purity. True? And garments are a symbol of character. True? 
So what is this saying? It's saying that the high priest has dressed himself in purity. And according then to the symbol, Jesus, between his baptism and his, the next step, which is the sacrifice, Jesus has to dress himself. How does Jesus dress himself? He dressed himself in a pure character. He dressed himself in, 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 in righteousness. He developed a perfect character. That's why the ministry of Christ, those three and a half years, are so detailed. And the Bible tells us that Christ, though tempted in all points like we are, yet he was without sin. He was pure, undefiled. Amen? Amen. To him who knew no sin. And so Jesus dressed himself as I, as a priest. He was covered in linen. He had a perfect, pure character. He had a perfect faith, perfect obedience, perfect righteousness. Don't we say amen for that? Amen. Why was he doing that? Because he was preparing himself for what? What was he preparing himself for? He is preparing himself for the great day of atonement. Amen? You need to follow me here, otherwise you're going to fall asleep. And it's very difficult to preach to a sleeping congregation, you know? So the priest, the, 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 the clothes of the priest are a symbol of the perfect character of Christ. You know, I often read the crucifixion of Jesus. And I am moved by the character of Christ. Christ has an amazing character. He is sweating blood. His soul is being torn apart by the agony of being separated from the Father. But who is he concerned about? He's concerning about his disciples. Guys, please pray. When, when Peter cuts the ear of Malcolm, Jesus could have said, oh yeah, well done, Peter, he deserved it. No, what does he do? He picks up the ear and he puts it on the, on the, on the, you know, on the back in the head of Malcolm. He's trying to save the high priest. He's trying, you know, he doesn't condemn uh, uh, Judas. He, 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 he endeavors to reach the heart of Pilate. When he's walking, he's being flogged. He's bleeding. He's weak. He's in pain. He's in agony. He's walking up the hill and he sees a group of women crying. He says, women, do not cry. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. The amazing character of Jesus. Amen? That's the clothes that the high priest had to put on in order to represent humanity, Israel, before the Father, before God. Christ could not atone for us in the day of atonement if he had an imperfect character. Amen? Amen? That's why he was sinless and perfect. Beautiful. I love Jesus. Do you? Oh, it's just the front that is uh, answering. I think the back is falling asleep. Do you love Jesus? It's still a bit weak. Then once the high priest was dressed, then he would take a sacrifice from where? From the congregation. In other words, the congregation provided the sacrificial animals, except for the bull that came from the high priest himself. Because the next event that we see between the labor, after the labor, after the baptism, the next great event that we see is the altar of sacrifice. And what is the altar of sacrifice a symbol of? Calvary. It's Calvary. Is the death of Jesus. And it doesn't take long to begin to, when you read the Gospels, that Christ is single-eyed that he's heading for death. True? True? He tells his disciples, I'm going to be killed. Many times he told them, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to be resurrected the third day. Yes or no? He knew where he was going. How did he know it? Not by revelation. He knew it because he had studied the Old Testament and he knew exactly where he was heading. Once at the year, once he was age 12 and he went to sacrifice with his father and mother, Passover, and he looks at the sacrifice and the Spirit of the Lord convicts him, you are that sacrifice. Jesus knew his destiny. 
And he followed the divine pattern because he knew the scriptures, friends. Amen? He knew the scriptures. And so when we come then around the altar of sacrifices, there are a number of events, and there are in the Old Testament, there are a number of sacrifices that take place in this altar of sacrifices. All of them represent one sacrifice. They represent Jesus Christ dying on Calvary. Amen? Did you get that? Three animals were taken from the people, two goats and one ram. Lots, you know, the, uh, 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 when this, the, 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 the priest comes out here, there's, two, there's the ceremony of the two goats and the casting of lots. One goat is chosen for the Lord, the other one is for a sassel. And the, sacri- the, the three sacrifices were offered that day was one bull, one goat, and one ram were offered for the Lord. They all represent the same. Remember that it, the, the, the sacrifice had to come from where? From the people. What, that does, what does that say? Who is the sacrifice, by the way? It's Christ Jesus. Isn't that saying that Christ was going to be one with us? He was going to become a human being. He was going to take our own body. He was going to become participate of our own lot. Yes? And the people were going to choose him to be the sacrifice. He was going to be provided as a sacrifice through a process of casting lots. Do you know what casting lots is in the scriptures? Casting lots is a system of choosing, but it's also a system of judgment. Do you remember when when Achan stole from the Lord and uh, in order to, to find out who he was, They went first through the tribe, then from the family, and eventually they found him. Remember? And Mrs. White says that they use a system of lots, casting lots. But it was a system of judgment, wasn't it? So according to the pattern, according to the Levitical pattern, the sacrifices, or the sacrifice, Christ was going to go through a judgment And he was going to be chosen to die for us. And someone else was going to be released. Now do we see that literally? Do we see that when Jesus, who is from among us, he was an Israelite. He was a human being. The people threw him to death. Yes or no? And Pilate presents Jesus and Barabbas in the midst of the judgment. Yes or no? And who did the people choose? Did you know that Barabbas is a symbol of Satan? And in choosing Barabbas, who were they choosing to leave? Satan. Satan. Remember the Old Testament ceremony? One goat was going to be killed. The other one was going to be left alive. But did you know that in heaven there was another judgment going on? That same hour, as human beings were choosing between Jesus and Satan, the two goats, in heaven there was also a judgment being done. Did you know that? Jesus speaks about it. Notice, Jesus says in John 16, 11, concerning judgment, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, because the ruler of this world is, present time, judged. And in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So, in the, this is absolutely beautiful, friends. When in the ceremony of the two goats, the Bible predicted that the time would come At Calvary time, when the universe would finally make their final choice in regards to Satan, and their choice would be, we want to have nothing to do with him. Throw him out. I thought you were going to say amen to that. And Christ then, who became the chosen of the universe, would die for us. But as human beings, we would condemn him to die through a process of judgment and choose Satan to be our prince. That's amazing, isn't it? 
It's all recorded there in the Old Testament. The universe, on the other hand, cast their final judgment on Satan. Did you know that Satan, after he made Adam and Eve fail, he re-entered heaven, he found a loophole, and now he became the rightful representative of the human race in heaven. Did you know that? And instead of Adam, Satan, you are studying the book of Job, you should learn this. And he became the representative, the head of the human race in heaven. And why did not God cast him out? Because he knew that the sympathies of the universe were still with Lucifer. And so God allowed Lucifer to develop the fruits of his kingdom. Amen? And when the fruits of his rebellion became mature in the fact that he killed the son of God, the universe said, we have to have nothing to do with him. And the two goats were separated. Christ was chosen to be the sacrificial one and Satan was chose to live for a while longer and then eventually he will become the scapegoat. Satan, dear friends, knows that Calvary brought the sentence of death upon him. He knows he's going to be destroyed. And we're going to understand through this system why, why is he so desperate. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes? Otherwise, I'll preach you something else. Oh, it's almost three o'clock and I'm halfway. Like always, I'm running in a hurry. So all the sacrifices symbolize to the experience in Calvary. And I want you to notice, in the Day of Atonement, friends, did you know that in the Day of Atonement, and we often have spoken of the Day of Atonement as being mostly the most holy place, the most holy place. But I don't, I, don't, I, I don't know whether you realize in the reading of Leviticus 16 that the Day of Atonement comes into view two times. But the altar of sacrifice comes into view four times. In other words, during the Day of Atonement, the preeminence is Calvary. And you're saying, Pastor Sam, are you telling me that the Day of Atonement began at Calvary? I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a little, in a little while. But what I'm showing you is, is that while Jesus was on planet Earth, everything he did, he did it to prepare and make ready for the final Day of Atonement. And that according to what we are learning in Leviticus 16, Calvary and the Day of Atonement are one event. They are not separated. Some Adventists think, no, we are a people of the most holy place. We must not put emphasis on Calvary. Look at how many times Leviticus 16 shows us Calvary. Did you grasp that? In other words, above all people, Seventh-day Adventists should be cross. Centered, Christ-centered individuals. The Lamb upon the cross should be the theme of, our, of, our very, of the very essence of who we are as a people because we are a people of the judgment. Amen? But the problem with Adventism, dear friends, is that we've become Laodicea and Laodicea has a problem. The problem is that Laodicea makes a dichotomy. It separates the most holy place from Calvary. And they leave Jesus out, or his, the dying Jesus, the crucified Jesus, is out of their experience. When Leviticus 16 sees no separation between the events of Calvary and the events in the most holy place. Amen? Not many amens. You're saying, Pastor Sam, I'm going to wait for my amen until you come up a little bit more. And I understand because I am an Adventist. And I am a conservative Adventist. But as I've studied this, I've been thrilled to discover the centrality of the cross in the Day of Atonement. Isn't that beautiful? 
Because if it was not for Calvary, you and I would have no hope in the Day of Atonement. True? True? And so Christ has prepared himself. How has he prepared himself? He has washed his body. He was baptized. He has dressed himself in holy garments. He has a perfect character. Amen? Perfect faith. Perfect obedience. Perfect righteousness. And now he's chosen by the people. One must die rather than all of us suffer. The people chose him. And they, through a process of judgment... They allow Satan to live, Barabbas, and Jesus goes to death. But in heaven, heaven chose Jesus and they discard Barabbas, I mean Satan, amen? And then he goes to Calvary and he dies. With that death, he has provided all the sacrifices needed for the most holy place experience. And so then... According to the, the, the narrative of Leviticus 16, the high priest, after he offered his bull, his go, he goes into the most holy place, offers incense on the altar, and he sprinkles blood in the most holy place for himself, for atonement. But he does not cleanse the sanctuary with the blood of that bull. He simply offers it on, the, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and then he walks out. He walks out, he offers the goat, and then he walks in again into the most holy place. The question I ask is this. After the death of Jesus and his resurrection, did he go to heaven and then come back to earth again pretty quickly? Did he? He did. And so according to the pattern... When the sacrifice dies, the blood of that sacrifice is taken right into the most holy place, is offered, and then he comes out. In a sense, that blood secures the ministry of the high priest. In other words, he is accepted. True? So he goes into the most holy place not to do cleansing, but the first going into the most holy place is for acceptance. To make sure that he is fine, that his sacrifice has been accepted. Do we find that? Do we find Jesus doing that? Notice in the, in the by the way, I'll point you in the, in the sanctuary pattern, this system. Jesus dies on, on, on the altar of sacrifice, Calvary. And then after his death and burial and resurrection, because that's the, the symbol of the labor, baptism, but also burial and resurrection. So Jesus has died. He's going to be buried. He's going to be resurrected. Where must he head after this? He has to go back to the sanctuary. Amen? Amen. But according to, uh, according to uh, Day of Atonement pattern, in order to prepare for the Day of Atonement, he must go into the most holy place, be accepted, and he must come out again and again do something at the altar. But he can, in the case of Jesus, Jesus died how many times? Once for all. So Christ cannot come out and die again. But I want to show you what he does. Notice, after his resurrection, Jesus went to heaven to present his sacrifice to God the Father. And Mrs. White says this in the book, the, sorry, John 20, verse 17. Uh, Mary Magdalene is going to touch him, Remember? Jesus said to her, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So what was Jesus doing that Sunday morning? He's going to heaven. Amen. He's going where? To his father. Amen. Notice what Mrs. White says in the Sarah of Ages 790. She says, Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. He ascended to the heavenly courts and from God himself he heard the assurance that his atonement for the sins of men had been ample. 
that through his blood all might gain eternal life, the Father ratified the covenant with Christ that he would receive repentant and obedient men and would love them even as he loves his Son. Christ was to complete his work and fulfill his pledge to make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of offer. All power in heaven and on earth was given to the Prince of Life and he returned to his followers in a world of sin that he might impart to them of his power and glory. Can you see how Mrs. White is actually following the sanctuary pattern? For me, that's exciting. It's so beautiful, friends. So Jesus goes into the presence of the Father and he comes out. According to the pattern, when he came out, he had to sacrifice a goat, but Christ has already made the ultimate sacrifice. Amen? Amen. So what is he going to do now that he comes out? I want you to notice in the book of Luke. He comes to the world and you know what, what he does? Jesus returned to the world to meet with his disciples in his conversation with them, he explained Calvary. In the book of Luke, chapter 24, says this, and he opened their mind to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, So it is written, and so it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Can you see how, what Jesus is doing? He comes out, and what does he do? He brings the attention of his church to where? To Calvary. And he explained in the scriptures the meaning of Calvary. Why he had to die. The purpose of his death. And he shows them in the prophecies how everything had been predicted. Isn't that beautiful? How long did he remain with his disciples? 40 days. True? According to the pattern... He has to go back where? The most holy place. Now, some Adventists have interpreted that Christ actually went straight to the most holy place and began his ministry in heaven in the most holy place. But we can't do that. Because you see, what I have shown you in Leviticus 16 is the pattern for the Day of Atonement. But before the Day of Atonement was the work of intercession, what is called the daily. And Jesus cannot jump straight into the Day of Atonement without accomplishing the daily work. Did you know that the preparation for the daily was very similar to the preparation of the Day of Atonement? According to the book of Daniel, The Day of Atonement would actually start at the end of 2,300 days. Yes? Daniel 8.14. So we allow a scripture to interpret scripture. Amen? And then at the end of 2,000, it says here that the sanctuary would be vindicated, but also it says cleansed in the King James Version. And that links immediately to what we read about the purpose of the Day of Atonement, which was a day of cleansing, a day of judgment, and a day of atonement. Amen? And so as we look at this, we realize that the cleansing of the sanctuary, the, the atonement itself, of, um, the Day of Atonement itself, would not begin in heaven immediately after Jesus ascended into heaven. What happened after his second ascension to heaven, Christ was anointed high priest or inaugurated as high priest and he began his work as the high priest in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And we've got plenty of evidence for that. John saw Jesus walking in the midst of the candlesticks. In the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation, whenever Jesus is seen, he's always seen in the holy place of the sanctuary. It's not until the end of Revelation 11 that actually the movement in the sanctuary moves to the most holy place. And that is after 1844. So dear friends, our, our faith is true. But what did Jesus do with his life on earth? His life, his death, his sacrifice and his first ascension to heaven. What did he do? He prepared what was necessary for the day of atonement. Amen? The preparation was ready. Nothing was lacking. And when 1844 came, Jesus 
went into the holy, most holy place of the, of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of cleansing. I must hurry up. So when the, when the sanctuary was cleansed, cleansed with the blood of the goat, the high priest went into the most holy place, anointed the Ark of the Covenant or poured blood in it, cleansing it. Then he went to the holy place and anointed the holy place with blood. And then he went to the courtyard and he anointed the, old, uh, the altar of uh, um, sacrifice. And that was the cleansing. And symbolically, what happened was that through that precious blood that they had not seen confessed, the sins of the people, as he anointed the different parts, were carried by the substitute, by the high priest. And as he goes out and he anoints the altar, then uh, the, the, the place and the people are being cleansed. How did Jesus accomplish this? Well, he's still accomplishing it. 1844, Christ moves into the most holy place and begins a process of cleansing and it is through a work of judgment. It's to cleanse us. It's to atone for us. This process brings the final atoning work in, you know, to bring God and his people together. But I want to show you something. According to the pattern, it says that after 1844, just before the high priest finishes his work in cleansing the sanctuary, he again brings the attention of the people to to the altar of sacrifice. What does he do? He anoints the altar of sacrifice with blood. He's bringing the attention of the people to the altar again, to the altar of sacrifice. What is that saying? What I believe, dear friends, that as Christ comes out of the most, or prepares to come out of the, of, the holy, of the most holy place, come out of the sanctuary onto planet earth again, we speak of that as being his second coming. Amen? His second coming. The first time he came, he came as a baby. The second time he came back to earth, he came as the risen savior, the high priest. Amen? The next time he comes, he comes as the conquering general. Amen? The second coming of Christ. And so when he comes out of the sanctuary, before that coming, God's people will be prepared for the reception of Jesus by leading them back to an experience with Calvary. And I want you to notice what he did in the 1800s, 1888. Do you remember that? The end of all things was nearing, the prophet was saying. What does God do? He sent a message to his people. We call that the message of righteousness by faith. And what was that message all about? It was simple. The message was Christ and his righteousness. Christ and him crucified. As the assurance for our salvation. Amen. So what does the pattern do? The pattern shows us that just before our Jesus comes out of the temple in heaven, he is going to exalt Calvary before our eyes to prepare us for his coming. Don't you say amen to that? That's why I say that of all people, Seventh-day Adventists should be the most Christ-centered. To heal Laodicea, we need to retake the cross and put it at the center of Adventism. Amen? The emphasis must be Calvary. That is the biblical emphasis. Amen? We are in the day of atonement. Jesus is doing a work of judgment in heaven for us. Our only hope is Calvary. Amen? Our only hope is found in the righteousness of Christ. Yes? But the work doesn't finish there. I must go. The, the, the high priest comes out. He does the work of atoning the, 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 high, the, the altar of sacrifice. And then they bring in the living goat or the scapegoat. And what does he do? He puts his hands on his head, on its head, and confesses the sin of Israel. And then the goat is taken to a wilderness and is it's completely removed. From Israel. Do we have a scapegoat ceremony in the Bible? Where Satan is actually taken to an inhabited land? Yes or no? You can read it in Revelation chapter 20. 
Notice what it says. It says, And the goat shall bear on him all their sins to a land in which no one lives, and he shall let the goat, uh, uh, the, the goat go in the wilderness. The scapegoat. I'm not going to read Revelation 20, but there is the millennium. During the millennium, Satan is actually confined to where? To planet earth as a wilderness. And the sins of God's people had been laid on him by Christ himself. Why? Because the, the, the first part of the judgment is finished. God's people have been found righteous. And their sins now are laid on him who caused them to sin. Amen? Some people say, oh, Seventh-day Adventists think that Satan is their savior. No! Christ is our savior because this God never sheds its blood. But this God, representing Satan as the originator of sin, because Christ through his blood has forgiven all our sins, and in a, in, a, in a judicial system you have to do something with this in order to get rid of get rid the universe of it, then these sins are laid on Satan as the culprit, the originator of all evil. Ellen White explains it this way. Gen uh, Great Controversy, page 673, she says... The wicked receive their recompense in the earth. They shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. Some are destroyed in a moment, while others suffer many days. All are punished according to their deeds. The sins of the righteousness, not as now, having been transferred to Satan. What is she talking about? This is the scapegoat ceremony. He is made to suffer not only for his own rebellion, but for all the sins which he has caused God's people to commit. His punishment is far greater than that of those whom he has deceived. After all have perished who fell by his deceptions, he is still to live and suffer on. I'll, I'll move on. Once he accomplishes the ceremony of the cleanse of the, of the, of the scapegoat, the high priest actually goes back into the, into the sanctuary. And he changes his clothes. Is there a, another return to heaven after the second coming of Jesus? Who goes to heaven with him? The righteous. Didn't Jesus say, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Isn't that beautiful? So according to the Bible, we go back to heaven. After Jesus has come back, now we all go back to heaven. And there is a changing of the clothes. Now Revelation, uh, Revelation 19 shows Jesus coming as a mighty conqueror, conqueror. And he has a new set of clothes. He's no longer dressed as a high priest. What is he dressed as? As king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? So at the end of the first part of the judgment, Christ, a ceremony of crowning has begun and it will finish at the end of the thousand years where Jesus becomes the king of the universe. And there is a judgment. I'm not, I don't have the time to do this. But actually Jesus goes back. The judgment continues. But there is no blood. There is no incense. There is no going into the most holy place. All atoning work is finished. Because now is the judgment of the wicked and they are lost. There is no longer atoning for them. This time lasts a thousand years. And then now comes, he comes out again. We call that the third coming when the whole of the universe comes to planet earth, comes out and again he burns offering on the altar of, of offering. He burns a burnt offering, another sacrifice. What is the sacrifice all about? It's Calvary. So at the end of the 1,000 years, God again, Christ again, calls the attention of all creation to what? To Calvary. Do we find that anywhere in the scriptures? Well, I'm going to show you a place here in the in, 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 uh, in a great controversy where Mrs. White talks about this. Notice what she says now. Christ again appears to the view of his enemies. Far above the city upon foundation of, him, of burnished gold is a throne. 
High and lifted up upon this throne sits the Son of God, and around Him are the subjects of His kingdom. The power and majesty of Christ no language can describe, no pen portray. The glory of the Eternal Father is enshrouding His Son. The brightness of His presence fills the city of God and flows out beyond the gates, flooding the whole earth with His radiance. It's the crowning of Jesus as King of Kings. In the presence of the assembled inhabitants of the earth and heaven, the final coronation of the Son of God takes place. The whole universe looks, both loyal and disloyal, even Satan and his angels are looking at Jesus. And now invested with supreme majesty and power, the King of Kings pronounces sentence upon the rebels against his government and executes justice upon those who have transgressed his law and oppressed his people. Above the throne, not as now. Above the throne is what? Above the throne is what? Friends, Leviticus told us that the third time, it's actually the fourth time, he comes out. He will bring again the attention of his people to, to Calvary. And here Mrs. White saw it in vision. Above the throne is the cross. And you've read this if you've read the last chapter of the great controversy. Suddenly, like a movie in motion begins to pass before the eyes of all the universe, the plan of redemption, specifically Calvary. Notice what she says. And now before the swaying multitude are revealed the final sins. The patient sufferer treading the path of Calvary. The prince of heaven hanging upon the cross. The haughty priest and the jeering rabble deriding his expiring agony. The supernatural darkness. The heaving earth. The rent rocks. The open graves marking the moment when the world's redeemer yielded up his life. There is, friends, again, Calvary. How important is Calvary for the Day of Atonement? It's essential. Do you know that after this view, Satan, his angels, and all the wicked recognize that they deserve death. So what is it that brings the rebellion to an end? What is it? It's Calvary. It's Calvary. Amen? Amen? And that seems to have finished. Because I ran out of time preparing my, my presentation, I finished. Oh, sorry, I extended so much. But dear friends, after that, do you know what happens? In Leviticus, there came a burning and cleansing and everything was purified. You know what happened at the end in, in great controversy? Fire falls from heaven and comes out of the earth and it consumes sin, sin as Satan and his angels. And everything is purified. And then the Lord recreates everything. And forever, God and His creation are one. And Revelation 21 shows us the celebration of the real Feast of Tabernacles. When God will come and tabernacle with His children forever to dwell with us. Amen? Amen. Dear friends, you and I are living in the very day of atonement. And after, in the next presentation, I'm going to show you the way we need to respond to the work that Jesus is doing in heaven. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we want to thank you so much for giving us in the Scriptures amazing amount of details regarding the work of Jesus. This confirms our faith. It tells us that truly we can trust in the work that Christ is doing. <coughs> and as he now is ministering before your presence in the work of judgment, we look forward, dear Father, to the day when, we, when he will leave the sanctuary and he will come to take us back to your home. We look forward to the day when there will be no more sin, no more death, no more Satan, no more evil angels. And Father, we will dwell with you forever. Oh Lord, we pray, do the work that you need to do in our lives. Make Calvary the very center. Make it preeminent in our lives. 
that as we go through the day of atonement, we may do it with confidence. For we have a, we have a high priest. And we have a sacrifice. Jesus, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.